Hello, and welcome back to Deductive Logic. I'm Matt Brown, and today we're going to be talking about formal semantics of our systems SL and QL. So um, we might start just by asking, what is semantics? What do we mean by semantics? Think about what that term means to you. Um, perhaps you think of it as a kind of way of dismissing an argument, like you're just arguing semantics, right? As if uh, you're not saying anything so important. A semantic argument is focused on how words are used or defined, what they mean, which gives us a hint at what we mean by semantics for a logic class. Um, so one way to think about semantics is a distinction between syntax and semantics. So syntax is concerned just with the form of sentences or arguments. Um, are, they, are they correct in their form, right? Without respect to their content. In, in English, the syntax of English, um, we call grammar, right? Grammar is a syntactical uh, notion, right? In our languages SL and QL, the, the rules for forming well-formed formulae are syntactical rules, right? They're concerned with the syntax of statements. Proofs um, are concerned with the syntax of arguments. They depend on the form of the arguments and not their content. Semantics, by contrast, is concerned with content. It's concerned with meaning. Part of providing the semantics for SL um, as well as for QL involves symbolization keys, helps us interpret what the um, formal statements mean. Another aspect of semantics concerns truth. So when we think about formal semantics, we're thinking about a rigorous formal way to give the semantics for a formal language. Um, the symbolization keys that we've given are relatively informal semantics. Formal semantics for SL can be captured um, by the information we give in a truth table. And we'll see towards the end of this video how we can capture the formal semantics of QL. The core of semantics is um, that you give an interpretation of the meaning of the statement, and then you figure the actual state of the world referred to by our, state, by our statement. And those two things together determine the truth or falsity of the statement. So we need to know what the statement means. And we need to know the state of the world that the statement refers to in order to determine the truth or falsity of the statement. As I said a moment ago, we've already been working with the semantics of SL when we did truth tables back in unit three. And what I'm going to give now is just a more rigorous formalization of the information that we get out of a truth table. Doing this, um, doing it this way will help prepare us to define the semantics of QL, which we can't uh, use truth tables to do. I'll explain why that is in a little while. We're gonna give a formal definition of truth in SL as a, as a sort of precursor. So first we start with this function A, um, A of P, where P is a, is a statement of SL. We call this function a truth value assignment. It's, the truth value assignment specifies uh, the state of the world by assigning a one or a zero to atomic sentences, right? So P, any P, any atomic sentence, right? You input it into this function and it gives you a one or a zero. Then we specify a second function V and we input not just an atomic sentence, but any sentence in SL whatsoever. Function V, we call a truth function. It gives the interpretation of complex sentences in relation to their component parts, and it'll depend on function A to uh, tell us about atomic sentences. So here's how we divide, define function V. Um, it follows the same recursive structure that defines well-formed formulae of SL, right? So if this looks a lot like the definition of a woof, that's the reason, right? So here's how function V is defined. So first, if A is atomic, then V of A equals A of A. Like we said before, A is the function that assigns a truth value, one or zero, to every atomic sentence A. So if sentence A is atomic, then VA just gives you that value. If A is of the form not B, where B is some, uh, some sentence that is a part of A with the negation sign added, then it just flips the, um, the truth value of B. So 
v of a is one if b is zero and zero otherwise. If a is of the form b and c, then v of a equals one if both v, b, and vc equal one and it's zero otherwise. You might be asking like, What's the point of this? This seems really obvious, but it's just to give us a, a very clear and careful definition of truth values that account for every main, every logical connective in SL. So continuing on. If A is of the form B or C, then it's zero if both VB and VC are zero and it's one otherwise. And you can just check this against your basic understanding of these connectives. It should track exactly right. Um, if A is of the form if B then C, then VA equals zero if VB is one and VC is zero and it's one otherwise. Um, if uh, A is of the form of the biconditional between B and C, then um, it's going to be one if v, VA is going to be one if VB equals VC, um, uh, always they give the same truth value or zero otherwise, right? Again, nothing should be too surprising here. These are just all the different connectives in SL given a kind of recursive definition of their truth value. And, and if you apply this definition of V, um, to any sentence of SL, no matter how complex, you'll get a one or a zero out based on whatever your truth value assignment A is. Now that we have a definition of truth in SL, we can uh, define other important semantic concepts, right? So uh, the first is the concept of semantic entailment, which we represent with this symbol here, the double turnstile, right? To say that A entails B is to say that there is no truth value assignment, right? No function A, where A is true and B is false, right? Or more generally, if we have a set of statements, A1, A2, A3, etc., there's no truth value assignment where A1, A2, A3, etc., everything on the left is true and B is false. Now we use, we've used a symbol like this double turn style before the single turn style um, on the left here to indicate that a proof is possible, right? So you, you may remember that from unit four where we talked about proofs. Um, the turn style or single turn style just indicates that um, whatever on the left, you can give a derivation for whatever's on the right. The double turn style on the right here, we use to represent semantic entailment, right? Which is unlike the single turn style, provability or deriv derivability is a syntactical notion, right? Semantic entailment is a semantic notion. Um, here are some other semantic definitions we can give in SL, right? Tautology, right? Remember the tautology is a sentence that is logically true, that is always true. Um, we can define in this way, right? As uh, something that is semantically entailed by um, anything, right? Any truth value assignment semantically entails A. In other words, A is true under any truth value assignment, right? Contradiction is the same deal, just with the negation, right? So A, um, a, a is a contradiction if A is false under all truth value assignments, or if, uh, if you have a semantic entailment of not A with nothing on the left. And then a statement in SL is contingent. We can define semantically just as something that's neither a tautology nor a contradiction. Here's a couple of other notions we can define uh, semantically in SL. A valid argument, right, is one where all of the premises of the argument semantically entail the conclusion. Remember, another way to read that is just that all of the, on any truth value assignment where all of the premises are true, the conclusion cannot be false. It must be true. There is no truth value assignment where all of the premises are true and the conclusion is false. That's a valid argument. Um, otherwise, it's invalid. Right? Logically equivalent sentences are sentences where 
um, A, two sentences where A semantically entails B and B semantically entails A, right? That means that whenever A is true, B is true, and whatever B is true, A is also true. We can define consistency semantically, but it's a little bit more complicated, right? A set of sentences is consistent in SL if and only if there's at least one truth value assignment for which all the sentences are true, right? And then the set is inconsistent if there is no such assignment, right? Um, so it's a little more complicated, but the basic idea here is as long as you can find some assignment of truth values that makes all the sentences true, they're consistent. So that was the semantics of SL. Let's talk about the semantics of QL, right? Now, truth tables and ordinary truth value assignments that we just saw how to do in SL don't work here. They don't work in QL because predicates don't have truth values by themselves. And quantifiers range over a potentially large number of sentences, right? Um, depending on the size of the universe of discourse. And so, you know, you're potentially innumerable or or maybe even infinitely uh, infinite number of atomic um, possibilities here means that there's no there's no um, kind of simple truth table you can give. Instead, what we use in QL we call models. Now remember, we used a symbolization key in QL to help us interpret QL statements by assigning a meaning to the predicates. Um, and the constants by specifying a universe of discourses and so on, right? In a model, we still use the idea of a universe of discourse to specify the scope of our uh, of our quantification, to specify the scope that um, for all x and there exists an x are going to, to quantify over. But now, instead of making a general statement like all animals, say, um, or all people in the universe of discourse, we're actually going to list the specific individuals in our universe of discourse, um, enumerate all of them for a model. Every predicate in our um, uh, model is gonna be defined by its extension, the set of things that the predicate applies to. And every constant is going to be defined by its referent, the specific individual thing that it refers to. The universe of discourse and the extension in a model are given as uh, sets, right? Um, we need to distinguish between a set um, and uh, what we call an ordered pair or ordered in tuple, right? Um, for larger than pairs, right? Um, we have ordered pairs when we have a two-place predicate, a relation that takes two terms. The extension of that predicate is a set of ordered pairs, right? So a, a regular set might look like this, right? The set of one, two, three, four would be the extension maybe of the predicate numbers one through four, integers one through four, right? Um, but um, if we had a two-place predicate, a relational predicate, um, the set of things in its extension would be a set of ordered pairs, right? We place the ordered pairs between the triangle brackets and the set itself between curly brackets, right? For three-place predicates, we'd have ordered triples. Um, for in-place predicates, we'd say call them ordered tuples or in-tuples, right? Um, we very rarely are you dealing with three-place predicates or four-place predicates, et cetera, but in case you do, keep that in mind. So that's how we think about um, the extensions of predicates in models. That's how we represent them. We'll see some examples in a minute. Lastly, we have, we have to make a distinction between what we'll call satisfaction and truth. Because QL has well-formed formulae with free variables like R, X, Y here, that's a by itself that has two free variables in it. You can't simply assign a truth value because of this to every atomic expression as you can with SL. R, X, Y doesn't have a truth value because the, the variables are not bound. But we can talk about the satisfaction of the predicate RXY relative to some assignment of objects to variables, right? So we can uh, assign the objects, uh, we can assign objects from our universe of discourse to X and to Y, 
And um, then we can talk about whether that assignment satisfies R, right? Whether those, um, whether that pair X, Y is in the extension of R. Now for sentences of QL, where there are no free variables, right? The satisfaction and truth are the same, same value, right? Truth values in QL are always gonna be relative to a model, just like truth values in SL are always relative to a truth value assignment, right? Satisfaction values, we can call them, are relative to both a model and a variable assignment. So there's an extra step in satisfaction um, that we can then uh, not worry about when it comes to truth values of actual sentences. So we're gonna do the same kind of um, careful definition that we did before. Here we've got the function a. Um, in QL, a assigns some object to the uh, from the universe of discourse to each variable x, right? Um, so when we when you plug a variable x in, um, you get what object it's assigned to, right? And then we use this funny notation here of um, of a with the brackets and omega and x. Omega here stands for an object in the universe of discourse. X stands for a variable. And what this shows is that um, we've substituted a different object for X than the one we normally have in A, but otherwise all of the other variable assignments agree with A, right? Um, I know that's maybe a little confusing, but we'll see how that works in an example in a moment. Let's let's now give a definition of satisfaction based on A. Right? So S is the satisfaction function. It takes in capital A, script A here, that is a, a sentence of QL or a woof of QL, actually, it doesn't have to be a sentence, any woof of QL. And then lowercase a here is that um, assignment of objects to variables, variable assignment, right? So that's, it's this variable assignment function here. So the function S A A is one, if the woof A is satisfied by the variable assignment A in our model M and it's zero otherwise, right? So what this is telling us is um, if, uh, if we have a, a woof A um, and it is satisfied by assigning the right variables to the to the right objects, um, then uh, it's one. And we have a recursive definition here of of how that works, right? So, if A is an atomic woof, right, um, of the form uh, P with some number of uh, uh, singular terms T after it, uh, sorry, terms that could be singular terms that could be variables. And omega is the object picked out by a certain term t, right? Then um, it's one if the um, set of objects is in the extension, the ordered in tuple of objects is in the extension of p and it's zero otherwise, right? Um, so, and it, it this last bit tells us that if the term is a constant, then the object omega is its referent. If it's a variable, then it's determined by the assignment function lowercase a, right? So I know this is a complex way to put things, but what, basically what this is telling us is um, under our uh, truth value assignment in our, in our model, if um, the atomic, woof A um, is uh, got these objects in its extension, right? Then it's one, right? Which is just how we define, um, if you think about it, it's just how we define truth for a, um, a, a, a woof of uh, QL informally. We, we, we ask, um, is the is the item or the set of, or the the ordered pair or ordered triple um, in in the extension right? Does it apply? Does the predicate apply? Now, um, if uh, A has the form not B, right? Then we have this similar recursive definition as we had for SL, right? It just flips the truth value, 
right? Um, if it has the form of an and, we get, again, it's one if the B and C um, functions are one. And for, for again, for, for disjunction, conditional, biconditional, it's the same as what we saw in SL, more or less, just the with the addition of the assignment of um, variables, the lowercase a, um, and the fact that we're talking about satisfaction here, not truth per se. Um, but we still have to know what to do with our quantifiers. So we have to add more components to our definition. One is for the universal quantifier. So if A has the form of for all X B, for some with B and some variable X, right? Then um, what we do is we use that, that idea with the square brackets, right? Um, if we substitute omega as the, val as the um, value for X, as the object that X is um, referring to, um, and we can do that for every object in the universe of discourse, right? And we get one as the satisfaction function for B in all of those cases, then we satisfied the universal quantifier. Right. So the, what this is telling us is if we substitute in every object in the universe of discourse in that variable X um, and we still get one, then the universal quantifier is satisfied. And probably not surprisingly for the existential quantifier, instead of saying for every member, it just says for at least one member. Otherwise, it's the same. Right. So that's how we use that. Um, square bracket notation here, right? It's used to define the satisfaction value for the quantifiers. And that's it. That's how we define satisfaction in uh, in QL. Um, so um, maybe this will help, right? We'll say here um, that uh, this variable assignment function A, um, it uh, assigns some um, object omega to the variable x, right? You notice I'm using a scripty x to indicate that this is a meta variable, not the actual variable x, right? So take the universe of discourse, right? Um, Trevor, Bella, and Jax are three people who are in our universe of discourse, right? Um, we assign the variable x. Now you see this is a regular x, so I'm actually taking the variable x, I'm assigning it to Trevor. I'll assign y to Bella, right? Um, and now we know, right, that our um, atomic woof Rxy is satisfied in the model M and relative to the uh, assignment function A, if and only if the ordered pair Trevor Bella is in the extension of R. So the extension of R will be some set of ordered pairs and if this ordered pair is in that set, then Rxy is satisfied by this A and this model, right? Um, now we swap in a different omega for X, right? That's that um, notation I just mentioned before. So for example, we could, we could substitute Jax in for Y. It reassigns Y to Jax instead of Bella, right? So we, can, we know that for all x, px is satisfied relative to m and to a, if and only if um, px is satisfied relative to a bracket omega, substitute omega for x for all members omega of the ud, right? So if, if um, in the case of the model above, right, if Trevor, Bella, and Jax are all in the extension of p, and p, x is satisfied relative to all of those substitutions, then for all x, px is satisfied. And because for all x, px is a sentence, it's true if it is satisfied. Woofs that are not sentences, by contrast, even though they may be satisfied, they can't be true or false. Now, as I've said, truth in QL is relative to a model. It only applies to sentences, and it is formally defined only for sentences that are woofs. 
we can kind of figure out for sentences using notational conventions, but they don't, strictly speaking, we can't apply all of our um, definition of, of satisfaction to them, right? Satisfaction in QL is relative to a model and a variable assignment. It applies to any woofs whatsoever. So let's look at some examples. Here you've got uh, a model, right? With the universe of discourse at the top, right? Consisting of three items. You have extensions for three predicates, D, M, and C. C is a two-place predicate or a relation. And you've got reference for three singular terms, E, J, and P, three constants, right? So we can determine the truth value of all of the sentences below, one through nine, by looking at this model and trying to figure out what the truth value is. So take a minute, try to figure it out for yourself, and then come back here, we will discuss it. Okay, let's see how you did. So number one, the truth value is one, because Elmer is in the extension of D, right? Now what about Patrick? Is Patrick in the extension of D? No, you can see it's Elmer and Jane only, so that's zero. CPE, so P is Patrick, E is Elmer, is Patrick comma Elmer in the extension of C? Yes, it is, so that's one. Um, Elmer comma Jane, however, is not in the extension of C, so that's zero. DE or DP, are DE or DP true? Well, DE is true, DE is one, DP is zero. We already know this from up here. And um, one or zero is one, so that's one. For all x, dx, that's gonna be true if for every member of the universe of discourse, um, d is satisfied. Every member of the universe of discourse is in the extension of d. Well, we see the extension of d is smaller than the universe of discourse, so we know that's gonna be a zero. Um, this is a little more complicated, right? This tells us if for every member of our universe of discourse, either dx or mx is the case, well, Elmer, Jane, and Patrick are all in either d or m, right? So that's gonna be one. There exists an x mx, number eight, that's gonna be satisfied as long as mx is true of any object in the universe of discourse. So as long as the extension of m has something in it, that's gonna be a one. And then this is a more complex statement. It's got two quantifiers for all x. There exists a y, right? And then this, st this statement. The way to interpret this is to say, well, um, for every x, right, it's either in the first place or the second place of uh, ordered pair in the extension of c. As long as for every x there is some y, such that x is in the first or the second place in one of these ordered pairs, that's gonna be satisfied. So Patrick is here, Elmer is here, Jane is here, they're all in here, right? In one place or the other. So that's also gonna be one. So that's basically how we use models to evaluate the truth value of sentences in QL. Now we can define the same semantic concepts that we've defined before for SL, for QL using models. And here's how we're gonna do that, right? Um, so for a tautology, right? Again, that's gonna be um, any sentence A that is uh, semantically entailed with nothing on the left-hand side of the entailment, um, of the entailment symbol. But in QL, that's going to be relative. That's going to be defined relative to models, right? So a tautology in QL is a sentence A that is true in every model, right? And a contradiction is a sentence that is false in every model, right? A sentence is contingent in QL if and only if it is neither a tautology nor a contradiction, right? So that's the same. So here. It's just key that models are playing the role that truth value assignments were playing in SL. So an argument is gonna be valid in QL. That's gonna be defined in terms of models again, if and only if there is no model in which all of the premises are true and the conclusion is false, right? Again, in terms of semantic entailment, it's the same. 
Um, and then it's invalid in QL otherwise. Um, or you could also say it's invalid in QL if there is some model, right, in which all of the premises are true and the conclusion is false. Two sentences of, uh, of QL, A and B, are logically equivalent in QL if and only if both A entails B and B entails A, right? Um, that is, uh, in every model where A is true, B is true, and in every model where B is true, A is also true. And then lastly, consistency. The set A1, A2, A3, etc. is consistent in QL if and only if there's at least one model in which all of the sentences are true, the set is inconsistent in QL if and only if there is no such model, right? So again, this is defining these semantic concepts now in terms of models. And uh, chapter five in the book has this handy chart here, which you can use to um, keep track of how we'd use models to determine these semantic concepts in QL, right? So you're gonna wanna come back to this um, this chart as you do some of your practice exercises it can be really helpful to learn these uh, different kinds of model evaluations what we're going to do next and our next lecture is um, we're going to apply this sort of models uh, reasoning to um, answering certain questions about these semantic concepts um, before you uh, go on to the next lecture. I suggest you try out some of the early practice problems um, uh, and make sure you have a good grasp of how to use models to um, figure out truth values. I will see you next time for more on models in semantics of QL. Bye.